Oh, I do. Can you see my slide? Yes. Great. Then I will get started. Um, hi, I'm Isaac Johnson. I'm a research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation. I'll be presenting my paper, Language Agnostic Topic Classification for Wikipedia, which is work that I did alongside Martin Gerlach and Diego Saez Trumper, who are also researchers in the Wikimedia Foundation research team. So let's start with the topic part for this project. What are topics for a Wikipedia article? That is, how do we describe what any Wikipedia article is about using a very high level and relatively small vocabulary? So we can do things like understand trends and page views or, or edits or help people find relevant content to their interests. So let's start with an example. So this is the English Wikipedia article for the Scarlet Baddest, an adorable little fish. How do we describe the topic of this article in a high level way? Well, luckily for us in English Wikipedia, there's an extensive ecosystem of what are known as wiki projects, groups of editors who work on content under a specific topic domain, and they go around tagging articles, among other things, that are relevant to their wiki project. So in this case, wiki project Fishes has tagged the article for Scarlet Baddis, but Fish is still a pretty specific topic, and we'd like to go even higher level than that. Again, luckily for us, English Wikipedia has just this mapping that relates these wiki projects to one or more of 64 different kind of high level topics. And this was an approach that was devised by Asthana and Hafiker in their 2018 CSD, CSDW paper, and we adopted here. So this is all well and good, but what about articles that haven't been tagged by English wiki projects or articles in other languages? And this is the problem we tackle in this paper. How to model a Wikipedia article such that you can predict its topics. And this isn't a new problem, and there are many ways to approach it, so I'm going to walk you through a few. So to be more specific, how do you represent a given Wikipedia article such that you can input it into a machine learning model of some sort that can then tell you what topics it predicts pertain to the article? Now, the most obvious approach, I think, perhaps, is to use the text of the article. And this is what Asthana and Hafiker did in their 2018 paper. They use a simple approach. It's quite effective. You could throw BERT or any much more complicated models over top two, but regardless, the text should carry plenty of signal regarding what an article is about, and every article has text. You could take an outlink-based approach, so just use the links in the article. As I'll explain shortly, this is the approach we take here. So ignore the text, just extract the other articles that it links to. You maybe throw out a bunch of data, but the links are a nicely fixed vo vocabulary. And the really important part is that while you could use a language specific links, so for instance, represent the Scarlet Baddis article as linking to the English Wikipedia article for freshwater fish, you can also treat the links as pointing to Wikidata items, the QIDs you see in that third step. And this makes the model language agnostic in that an English Wikipedia article that links to a freshwater fish is represented the exact same way in the model as the Spanish article that links to a Spanish language version of the article for freshwater fish and so on. So the model can make predictions for language additions it has never seen as long as the links are to known Wikidata items. And Picardi and West did this in their 2020 paper and they showed it to be quite effective. And there are other approaches, Wikidatabase, so ignore the Wikipedia article entirely. Instead, look at the article's associated Wikidata item and the statements it contains, use those for the modeling. We can keep doing this exercise for at least other, a few other approaches. So you can see there are a lot of ways that one might and many have approached this problem. So how did we choose the outlinks based approach? Well, we did it based upon the following guiding principles. Our first principle was coverage. We wanted a model that would work for almost any Wikipedia article in any language, even if it was a fairly new article. And we're focusing on three approaches here, outlinks, text, and Wikidata, because they all do pretty well here. All articles have text, almost all have links, and almost all are linked to a Wikidata item. Next was size and simplicity. So how many model parameters, how long to train the model, does it store comfortably in memory, things like that. Here, the outlinks and the Wikidata based models do well. They use a relatively small vocabulary that's based on Wikidata, covers every language of Wikipedia. They don't require language parsing. This means you can build a single model for all languages. The text based approach requires individual pre processing models, probably word embeddings for each language, and this is far harder to scale. Feedback. 
Is there a clear path to improving the predictions? For outlinks and text, I'd argue yes. If there's topics that are missing, you add content to the article that is relevant. Wikidata kind of breaks this feedback loop though, because the topic predictions are based on the Wikidata item, not the individual article. And so there's this kind of disconnect. And finally, performance. Performance is generally the foremost principle that papers use in declaring success with the model. We purposely put it last to emphasize that other considerations take precedence here. That said, all three models actually perform quite well. Outlinks and text a bit better than Wikidata, but in the same area. So based upon this, we chose a topic classification model based upon article outlinks. While there's certainly room for improvement, I think this model is unique in its ability to satisfy all of these principles at once. Um, some quick specifics on how the outlinks model actually does. Uh, so coverage, we're close to 100% of articles on Wikipedia having at least one outlink, so that's great. Um, size and simplicity. It takes about 10 minutes to train the model and we use the fast text Python library here. Um, and it's less than a gigabyte for the entire model um, on disk. So that's including the 50 dimensional embeddings of which there's about 4 million for this model. Feedback, because the model is so simple, we've already identified some areas of low recall and ways that we might improve the data here. So that's good. And then performance. So in the standard kind of held out test set, um, we found that the text-based approach or the link-based approach was in, within 1% of the text-based approach for precision, close to 90%, recall close to 80%, F1 and average precision curve. These are all micro statistics. Um, for macro statistics, it was a little bit lower, but still in the same area. And then we also gathered feedback from Wikipedians on 10 examples of each topic in five different languages. So these are examples that we might not have had ground truth data for. And here we beat the text-based approach by five to 10%, depending on the language. So this shows that this link-based model does transfer well across languages. Finally, a few thoughts on what's next. Um, there's an API and dumps of all the model predictions. So I'm gonna paste these links at the end, but I encourage everyone to go kind of explore, test it out. Um, we're considering more types of language agnostic models using this framework or similar frameworks. Uh, there's always model improvements you can do, things like imputing links that haven't been added yet, which is something that Cardi and West do in their work, as well as different model architectures, things like graph-based methods. And finally, and perhaps most important, this question of addressing biases. So the precision is quite high, but we do see areas of low recall, and we're looking into those and trying to understand what's going on there. Um, and also, I think just a bigger question of whether this is the right taxonomy of topics. So I mentioned it's based upon English Wikipedia, um, but it's not clear that that actually applies to all the other languages, even if you can build a model that will make good predictions based upon that taxonomy. And with that, I will close my presentation. If we have time, I'll take questions. Otherwise, I'll be happy to answer them in the chat. Um, and Martin Diego, my uh, co-authors, will be able to field questions as well later in the poster session. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Um, I think we have time for a question. Titsana is our yep. Q&A manager. Do we have questions from the chat? Yeah, there is a question from Akil. Maybe Akil, if you want to ask uh, directly the question. Or... Sure. As uh, you want. Hi, Isaac. Thanks for the nice talk. Just curious, did you guys try using the pre-trained embeddings available via fast text or even sentence transformers? There are multiple uh, multilingual embeddings available. And how, why do you still think they are resource inefficient if you have pre-trained models and can be used for a downstream task? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. We did consider, and I've done some work around this, um, two reasons why we don't use kind of this text-based approach. One is that the embeddings uh, rarely are actually available for all 300 languages. And when they are languages that don't have that much content, the embeddings tend to be relatively low quality. Um, so there's that kind of piece of it. And then even if you do have these pre-trained embeddings, you're still training kind of a specific model for each language. And while, you know, 10 models, not so bad, as you get up to 300 models, it ends up being a lot of models that you have to be kind of monitoring and training and, and a lot of disk space, so. Thanks, thanks for the answer. Okay, then there is another question. Uh, maybe, Chang, you, you want to ask directly or? Oh yeah, for the um, feedback and for the quality check, 
Um, Isaac, your research uh, takes five languages from the English and Vietnamese, Vietnamese and Francis, but uh, are there any criteria for that? I mean, um, usually, um, is it based on the uh, quality of the results or based on the number of the editors, or et cetera? Yeah, for those languages, it was based upon the availability of folks who could go, you know, Wikipedians in those language editions who would go through the predictions and accurately say, yes, this topic applies or no, this topic doesn't. Um, we also do when we do the held out test set, uh, we're using all English level ground truth, but we do propagate it across the languages. So for instance, for a subset of articles in pretty much every language, we have this held out test set that we can test against too and show that we get good performance still. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. Oh, thank you. Okay. Then there is uh, one last question uh, from Finn about the uh, hardware requirements, uh, particularly uh, memory wise. Can you run yeah. uh, this in with a small memory fingerprint? Yeah, so I, um, one of the reasons I use the FastX library so much is I've found it to be really forgiving about a lot of things. Um, it's designed to run fully on CPUs. It's very simple, so it trains very quickly. Um, the whole model, like I said, is under a gigabyte. So if you have essentially a gigabyte, gigabyte and a half or so of RAM, you can store it all in, in memory and make predictions quickly. Um, you know, we use it on the servers, but I've used FastX on my laptop. To, to great effect too. Um, so I highly recommend it. Yeah. Okay, we should run on DualForge, yes. I think we can go oh. to the next presenter to turn on maybe- There's another uh, question. I don't know if there is time. Uh, there is not much time, unfortunately. Okay, okay we can- uh, wait Isaac, would you mind answering it in the chat? Yep. Okay. All right, we have a second oral presentation, which is from Kandakar Tansim. Um, uh, yes, yeah. I'm Are here. you here? Are you here? Yes. Great. Uh, please share your screen. You should have the, the permissions to share the screen. Go ahead. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, hi, I'm Konduka Dustin Hawk. I'm a PhD student and I'm studying in University of South Florida. Today, I, I'm going to talk about opinion dynamics and group decision making process in Wikipedia content discussion. And this work was done by me and my supervisor, Giovanni Luca Shampaya. So in English Wikipedia, every day, thousands of uh, articles are created, but not all of the articles uh, can meet the guideline of the Wikipedia properly. To monitoring the quality of the article, there is a process called article for deletion in which um, editor and reviewer can have discussion and uh, can recommend delete or keep for the article. And based on the consensus, decision is uh, made. So uh, today I will walk through our research questions such as uh, are there in biasing factor that correlate with the voting patterns of the editors and how, how do these biasing factors evolve over time and form among the editors? And also can the estimated votes can be regarded as the predictive factor of the AFD final outcomes. So in prior work, Mayfield and Black have proposed a predictive model of individual vote and outcome of the AFD discussions. And their model was based on the natural language processing. And they have used the uh, AFD discussion log from 2005 to 2018. In our analysis, we also have used the same data set. So our first question is, are there any biasing factors that can explain the voting patterns, such as the degree of agreement or disagreement with her peers? For that, at first, we have measured the bias or the preferences of uh, each individual editors by calculating the probability of keep. And this score is between zero to one. Zero is the indi uh, indi indicator of uh, being full deletionist who often recommend delete for the article. And one is the indicator of being full inclusionist. And then we fit Gaussian mixture model so that we can get the major group of the editor 
in prior work, Tara Burili and Shampai have found two major groups who, which are deletionists and inclusionists. And in our um, recent analysis, we have found more than two groups, major groups. And the four major groups are strong deletionists uh, who, are, uh, who have the score goes up to zero, then moderate deletionist, then moderate inclusionist and the strong inclusionist. Then for capturing the agreement or disagreement uh, level, at first we have uh, created a bipartite network among uh, the set of the editors and the set of the AFD discussions or the articles. So in this bipartite network, each age uh, uh, signi uh, signifies the recommend they, uh, they have uh, casted, for example, keep or delete. And then from this bipartite network, we have uh, built a signed network among the editors. Here, each age uh, between the editors uh, is the indicator of participating in the same discussion. And the sign, the positive sign is the indicator of, uh, a uh, of uh, recommending the same uh, action and negative sign is the indicator indicator that most of the cases, the, the rec their recommendation is different. So then we fit community detection model, Zuvang. And from this model, we have found four major groups uh, who are based on the connections of the voters. Then we have uh, analyzed uh, K-Core. K-Core is the maximum subnetwork of a network such that each uh, every node has degree at least k. So the higher degree k, uh, core, we have uh, we have found the most central user. So uh, we can find the most active user, or they have participated in the most popular article uh, discussion. So at this point, we have found two types of faction, which are GMM faction based on the preference or the bias, and the Leuven faction based on joining to the same discussion. And then we calculated the Spearman correlation between the faction and the uh, age information, such as the sign and the weight. And we have found that GMM faction has the higher correlation. That means the individual level bias explains more the pattern of agreement among the editors. And we also have found that at the higher core, the, uh, the higher correlation, that means the core of the network is dominated by like-minded editors. Then our second question is how do these preferences on content, content inclusion or deletion form among the editors and how do they evolve over time? For that, at first we have selected the most central editors from the sign network and then we split the discussion they have participated in 10 equal sized bins and then we compute the probability of keep from each bin, and then we obtain the preference trajectory deciles. And again, we fit the Gaussian mixture model. In this case, we also have found qualitatively similar kind of sim uh, similar number of groups, uh, such as strong inclusionist, moderately inclusionist, strong deletionist, and moderate uh, deletionist. And we also found that the preference are relatively, relatively stable over time, but there is a substantial narrowing of the opening at the early period of the reviewers. So this can be, this is an evidence of social learning due to the imitation of the uh, peer reviewer. And also we have found that the deletionists are highly resistant to change their opinion. Our last question is, can the estimation of the votes of the editors be regarded as the predictive factor of AFD outcomes? So at first, we, uh, we used latent factor model so that we can estimate the by hidden, uh, hidden factor of the editors and the articles also. Then we use the predicted or estimated ratings as features and use the logistic regression for uh, building the predictive model for AFT outcome. So, and uh, as the features are the con uh, continuous value, so we also introduce uh, a threshold 
above which we assign positive one, which is the indicator of keep fort. Otherwise we assign negative one, which is the indicator of delete fort. So this is the result of our um, uh, a final AT outcome predictive model architecture. So at threshold minus 0.4, we have found the highest accuracy, which is 82%. And we also have found the weighted precision and a weighted F1 score. And at the threshold minus 0.4, we have found everything highest, every uh, performance metric highest. At the right hand side, you can also see the ROC score. And we also got the highest ROC score at the threshold minus 0.4, which is 82%. And in summary, we can uh, we can say that we have found the voting pattern of the editors can be explained by the degree of agreement and disagreement of their peers. And also inclusionists are more open-minded than the delusionists. And it is possible to uh, predict or infer the outcome of the uh, AFD discussion simply from the knowledge of the composition of the AFD group, such as the bias of the editors or bias of the article. And we also uh, have found that active and uh, experienced editors are from the early phase of the AFD project. And though they are the cohorts from 2005 to 2008, and we have discussed in details in our uh, paper and you can check out our GitHub repository to reconstruct our findings. And that's all, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you so much. Um, Tiziano, can you tell us if there is something from the so chat? So we don't have a question in the chat. Okay, um, so what we can do uh, while people think about questions, maybe, you know, this, this was an amazing presentation. So maybe there is a little bit of, of thinking to do before uh, formulating the questions. We can maybe start the lighting talks and you will answer the questions in the chat. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. Sorry, we are a little bit late with the workshop. So I think uh, if that works for you, we're gonna uh, go to the, to the lighting talk session. Okay, thank you so much. Tiziano, thank you so much for uh, monitoring the chat. Uh, all right. Um, Elad, I believe you are the first speaker for our second lighting talk session. So okay. please get ready. I'm going to share the screen. Yes. So this is the one from before. Very slowly, I think you will get there. Okay, so this is you, right? This is your presentation. Yes, yes, uh, oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. This is no, the slide. No, perfect, perfect. All right, so remember you have three minutes each. Please let's keep it on time. And okay. so first, right? let me paste. Floor is yours. Okay, first, let me paste the link in the chat. Okay, so uh, my name is Elad Vardi. I'm a PhD student at the Hebrew University under the guidance of Professor Lev Muchnik. In my research about pe pro uh, public trends and content consumption, I wanted to use the traffic data from Wikipedia. I noticed that Wikipedia is sharing the traffic dumps, but not in a way that is efficient to run big queries, as it gives you the traffic per hour, but not per subject. Online tools were lacking uh, critical features, they were not uh, well maintained and had other major uh, disadvantages. For example, they didn't allow to search the Wikipedia's uh, entire traffic history. So I downloaded the entire dumps, but using it required a lot of effort. I also saw that uh, many other researchers uh, use the traffic dump again and again from scratch. Uh, to solve this, we created Wik Wikishark. You can uh, go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, Wikishark is an online tool that it's easy to use, is hourly updated, uh, allows querying all of the traffic data back to 2008. It also enables searching and comparing unlimited titles, view charts, and export the results as data files or image files. Uh, there is also a browser extension that lets you see the traffic directly on Wikipedia. And we also developed a trend engine, uh, surfacing new trends and hot uh, topics. 
In the next slide, I will briefly explain uh, how is the data stored. So after downloading the, all of the data dumps, we discovered that over 90% of the titles had never more than 255 pages within an hour. So for those 90%, we save that in an efficient binary way, uh, which means only uh, one uh, byte per hour. And for the rest, we use only three bytes per hour. Uh, moreover, the data was saved in a sequence and it allowed um, much less disk access request. And so query to the whole data since 2008, which means uh, about uh, 13 years, takes only a few milliseconds. And this way, it allows us to run big data queries on the page views data. Finally, if you are interested in collaborating with us on either data or analysis, we are happy to explore such uh, opportunities. If you want to learn uh, more, uh, come to meet us. We are at room number four. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elad. Uh, welcome. Neru, thank you. Neru, you're next, I believe. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, so the paper which I'm going to discuss talks about the reorganization of information in Wikipedia articles. So uh, in the next slide, we can see that uh, by reorganization of information, I mean how factoids are rearranged in an article and uh, the level of factoid in this uh, paper we have taken as sentences. So in each, with each revision, uh, sentences get edited, new sentences are getting order, uh, inserted, they are reordered. So uh, do they do it progressively? I mean, with each revision, does it happen? Uh, does it impact the semantic sem uh, semantic meaning of that article positively, or just some random thing happens in, in uh, Wikipedia articles? So we wanted to evaluate this, and for this we collected a, a sample of Wikipedia articles using stratified sampling, so that it can re represent the actual uh, class distribution of articles. So um, yes, so uh, we uh, calculated semantic similarity between uh, consecutive sentences, and then uh, average uh, semantic similarity of, an, of a revision, and then we observed how it varies with each revision. So in the observation section, we can see that in the first observation, we found out that uh, the overall uh, semantic similarity increases as we go with uh, the subsequent revisions. And uh, in the Pearson correlation density, uh, it was a positive value. And thus it implies that the overall um, semantic similarity within sentences or factoids here, the semantic similarity increases. And in the observation two, we try to see, um, yeah, so we know that uh, Wikipedia articles are divided among certain classes, uh, star, stub, FAGA, good articles. So, um, so they are uh, supposed to be of varying quality. And uh, we wanted to check how the semantic similarity varies within these articles, within these classes. So uh, we observed that, uh, yeah, according to our hypothesis, the average semantic similarity was increasing as we go with the higher quality of higher quality class of Wikipedia articles. So yeah, so users are not randomly shuffling the sentences, editing the sentences. They are uh, uh, positively contributing in the uh, development of each article. So yeah, that was our observation for this. That's uh, thank you so much, Neru. Uh, Andreas, you're next. Now, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So yes, uh, I will speak about the role of local content in, in uh, Wikipedia, and especially how it uh, relates to editor and reader engagement. So basically, well, what is local content? So local content is like the content which corresponds to the cultural context of a Wikipedia language edition, like geographical places, historical events, political figures, etc which correspond to this uh, language community and this uh, is about a quarter of all wikipedia uh, language edition all of the content is a, is a local content okay and we <clears throat> we now look at does this local content reflect the higher level of editor and reader engagement this is the question we're looking at and in the next slide uh, we can see a nice figure for uh, several language editions so on, on the top the top bars 
the, the dark green bar <coughs> corresponds to the percentage of uh, Wikipedia pages which, uh, which are local content. And then we see that uh, if we look at the page views, which is the light green bar, we already have a higher percentage of page views which are directed, which these pages attract. And if we further look on the edits, we have the orange bar, which is the edit by registered editors, and the red bar is the edits by anonymous editors. And we see that the, the further we go there, down there, the more the highest proportion, especially it's especially high for anonymous editors. Okay, so then in slide, in the next slide. This leads us to, uh, to the hypothesis or the conclusions that the local content is more engaging for readers and especially for editors. And uh, anonymous edit, we see even a higher proportion of it. So that uh, somehow leads us to the hypothesis that these editors, the editor's interest in the local Wikipedia project is more likely to be ignited by this local content. So this is actually might be a way to get uh, new editors to Wikipedia promoting this kind of content. So, and, and, and basically, instead of considering this type of a bias, because every language edition favors, of course, this, its uh, local content related to its language edition, it should be a, a seen as relevant and uh, important and for both expanding the diversity and the content of Wikipedia and attracting new uh, editors. And if you are more want to see more, we are in session four or, or room four. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Andreas. Anna Mika, you're next. Hi. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, this is Shubham. I'm actually the second author for it. I oh, will okay. be taking up it. Yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, actually, we all know, right, uh, that Wikipedia is uh, open source and uh, anyone uh, from the public can create the account and rewrite the article. So obviously we all uh, agree that uh, there needs to be some rating mechanism, right? Uh, rating mechanism via which uh, we can grade the articles. Uh, some, uh, we, uh, the idea is to have some uh, no, uh, article grades to each and every article, right? So uh, that's what the core idea is. And uh, I think it's already been taken care of, but uh, the one of the prominent ways via which we were no, grading the articles is uh, the quality grades, right? Uh, is uh, the manual interventions. We are using some other other rating systems or everything. People have tried to automate it. They have tried some natural language uh, processing methods or some social network methods. So our idea is very much uh, no, based on the social network uh, analysis. We are using the social network uh, properties uh, to train the models and predict the quality grades of articles. Next slide, can you please? Uh... Yeah. So what we have done is actually we have collected the for each and every node of the Wikipedia articles we have uh, calculated uh, these uh, network properties over them, that is uh, in degree, out degree, between centrality, cat centrality, page rank, uh, clustering coefficient, hub scores, and uh, shell number, h index, and uh, these ten properties right which have been mentioned. So we have tried to plot the graphs on the seeing that how you no know, and try to observe that you now how these uh, start stub and articles are behaving uh, depending upon these properties. And then uh, we collected all the Wikipedia articles names and their corresponding quality grades, must uh, both these informations uh, uh, in the block diagram, you can see that we have merged both this information to create the data set for ourselves, right? Uh, in this data set, what we are doing, we are trying to train the, the we try to train different machine learning models, uh, the classification machine learning models to predict the qualities uh, over these properties. And uh, yeah, the best results we are getting with, with the random forest, yeah. Uh, the random forest is giving us the best results as we can see in the confusion matrix uh, and uh, the different scores for the random forest when we trained it over our, this, uh, uh, this data set. Uh, and uh, then we try to compare our results with it. Uh, uh, there were the two types of the peoples, two types of the researchers who have tried to uh, perform the similar kind of uh, classifications. One was the multi-classifications, like uh, they are trying to cover the whole spectrum. And the other was uh, the peoples who were trying to do the binary kind of classification. Uh, we have compared our accuracy along with them. And uh, yeah, one thing like at, at the end that I would like to mention is uh, that the few papers uh, have some eliminated the A class or FA class. They haven't uh, expressed the reasons that why they are eliminating all these class. But uh, yeah, we have tried to uh, focus on all the whole spectra of the seven classes. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sebastian, you're next. 
Uh, right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sebastian, and uh, together with my two colleagues, Florian Lemmerich and Markus Strohmeyer, we tackled inferring sociodemographic attributes of Wikipedia editors by looking at several state-of-the-art approaches and possible implications for editor privacy. Next slide, please. Um, this is the overview of our approach in total illustrated for a, a specific user. And here we can see all the different parts of a standard profile page. For example, the profile text is located in the middle of the page. Below that, we have the categories a user chose to associate himself with. And on the right, we have the different user boxes. And as you can see, editors tend to display lots of different information about themselves, like uh, in this case, that uh, he was part of the military, the time that has passed since he joined Wikipedia, his gender, his age, and so on. And as we can see, the profile text is used as input feature after applying some kind of embedding. And uh, the extracted social demographic attributes are also used as labels, and then both are given to different classifiers with the goal of predicting an editor's gender, age, education, and religion. Next slide, please. And the prediction results we can see here are um, for our different models based on precision recall and F1 score. And the results show that uh, BIRD outperforms TFIDF and Dr. Vec for all sociodemographic attributes. And uh, predictions for the attribute gender are more accurate than the pred predictions for the remainder of the attributes. And a very important aspect deals with the implications for editor privacy because um, we should only utilize the acquired labels on an aggregated level to find general disparities in the Wikipedia editing community, uh, which was our initial goal, because using this kind of information on an individual level, for example, for personalized recommendation, uh, would erode editor privacy and would therefore most likely result in unethical applications. But the problem is that not disclosing personal attributes is not enough, since as long as large enough sets of editors still decide to disclose some sociodemographic attributes, um, this would enable predictions for editors who might, uh, who might have explicitly decided against it. So if someone is really concerned with the privacy, that person should probably refrain from using their user page or at least uh, shouldn't use their user boxes to make automated processing and uh, predictions more difficult. And now I'm handing over to Oscar, I believe. Oscar, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Oscar, are you around? I don't see the chat. So if there is. Ah, anyone... sorry. I yes. was muted. No, <laughs> I okay. was... good. Please go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, hello all again. Uh, I'm Oscar Ake and I'm presenting to you the research uh, we carry out together with Lorenzo Gatti and Kiriaki Kalimeri. Uh, in this work, our aim is to model the Liberty Moral Foundations from text. Uh, next slide, please, Miriam. Language is a key vehicle uh, with which we express our beliefs and values. In this study, we operationalize morality via the moral foundation theory. Originally, the theory presents five foundations that have two polar opposites, vice and virtue. Refining their mod the, this model, the creators of the theory propose a sixth dimension, the liberty dimension. Individuals that value strongly this moral value are consistently less concerned about individual level concerns, such as harm, benevolence, and altruism. Uh, there are also much less concerns with, with group level moral issues, for, in, for instance, uh, conformity, loyalty, tradition, uh, that are typically associated with conservative morality. The moral foundations theory is commonly used in computational science, and while for the, ma the, for the ma main five dimensions there are less equal resources, for the liberty dimension still there is none. Uh, Miriam, can you pass to the next slide? Here, our goal is to assess how people express the moral values of liberty through text. Since, since this paves the way to, under, to understand conflict, conflicting social issues, such as vaccine he, hesitancy and subset, subjectivity to, conspira, to conspiracy theories. 
Since, according to the Moral Foundation theory, the vice and virtue of the liberty scale relate to the conservative versus liberal political spectrum, we, considering the, we consider the Wikipedia pages and their conservative counterparts as a natural experiment. We collected all the conservative pages and we tried to align them with the respective Wikipedia ones. We received um, 37,000 uh, 37, aligned pages. The figure shows the frequency distribution among the Wikipedia and Conservapedia documents. At the top left, the blue dots, we found the terms most, com most, commonly, most commonly used in Conservapedia, for example, Antifa or Homosexual Agenda. In contracts, at the bottom right, we find the terms most used in Wikipedia, for example, Affordable Care. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in the red dots. Then we use a lexicon generation method, including the use of word embeddings trained from our data set. Using this derived resource, we finally obtain an annotated vocabulary that aims to model the liberty dimension. This is a preliminary and novel work. Uh, currently, we are working on refining the obtained dictionary to accurately model the liberty dimension. We are evaluating the quality of the 10 resource on, value, on various uh, real life scenarios such as news and Twitter debates. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will, I will be happy to take them. Also, I will be in session uh, five. Next speaker is um, Wukun, I think. Sorry if I, Chan, Chan Wuk, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, thanks, Oka. Uh, this is Changuk Jung from KAIST and IBS, South Korea. I'm presenting the study about information flow on COVID-19 over Wikipedia, which is part of the topic knowledge creation and diffusion. This research has been done by KAIST, IBS, Postec, Sungshu University Wikimedia Foundation, and Max Planck Institute. Uh, next slide. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, misinformation killed people. One of the fatal incidents was a rumor that methanol might cure the coronavirus. This misinformation spreads worldwide and harms more than 700 people just in Iran. How can we stop it? Misinformation can be blocked um, by the facts at the right time, right place from credible information sources such as Wikipedia. In this study, we analyzed the pattern of information generation and consumption by languages to provide the information needed in each language services. With the analysis, you can see the regional and cultural similarities and differences of the pattern in Wikipedia language services. First, we chose 11 target languages and collect COVID-19 related items in Wikipedia using Wikidata relationship. Then view counts and edit counts are collected and we categorize the items to see the topic shifts. Next slide, please. With the collected items, we ranked all 11 lists. Also, we made um, correlation matrix and clusters the hierarchically based on the list to check the likeness between the languages. The clusters in first figure indicate similarity in readers' interests with view counts. The results reveal that European languages come together while East Asian languages make a cluster. Wikipedia items were categorized into four topics with a um, biomed, with um, biomedical information and the reason people and others. Such categorizations makes it easy to analyze how the pattern differs from other languages. The second figure shows the number of coronavirus pandemic related documents and the amount of access were examined by category. Although the number of items in the biomed category is just three, um, coronavirus pandemic, coronavirus 19, and SARS-CoV-19, the view counts is relatively high and it indicating that um, there are high demand. In a nutshell, we found that information generation and consumption in Wikipedia are related to cultural and geographical connections. 
to establish the uh, basis of the information provided strategies for the next outbreak or next pandemic, the information generation and consumption speed and item network developments should be examined. We published our data set on Figshare to promote more analysis from other researchers. And also our data collecting method code is available on GitHub. I will um, post the links on the chat. Thanks. Um, I will wait for the comments in room four. The, and next will be Karthik Madanagopa will present the marvelous research about knowledge gaps. Hello, everyone. I'm Karthik Madanagopal from Texas A&M University. Uh, I'm going to talk about my current research with Dr. Cavalli towards ongoing detection of linguistic bias on Wikipedia. First of all, what is neutral point of view? Next slide, please. It is a Wikipedia guideline that expects all articles to be returned fairly, proportionately, and as far as possible without editorial bias. And yet, knowingly or unknowingly, some form of subjective bias is injected into the subjective treatment of facts in Wikipedia articles. Let's take a look at these two example statements that are extracted from Wikipedia. The use of the highlighted words in these two statements introduces a subtle form of subjective bias that can influence the reader's perspective on those topics. Not all articles are reviewed for NPOV. Only articles that are tagged by readers or editors are disputed at the NPOV board. Especially in case of current events like 2021 storming of United States Capitol, as the event unfolds, these articles were viewed by millions of viewers before it being revised by the NPOV board. It may be possible that some of the readers might get influenced by the subjective content present in those articles. There is a need to build a robust bias detection algorithm crowdsource in, in case of these crowdsource encyclopedias like Wikipedia. Various researchers in the past have built classification models that can detect bias statements as the writing styles of Wikipedia editors change over time. And some editors try to actually evade these kind of bias detection models by using different language styles. These models struggle to detect more subtle and emerging forms of bias. This is mainly attributed to the fact that these models were solely built using Wikipedia data alone. The primary focus of my research is to build bias detection models that are more resilient, that can self-adapt over time. Such models should be robust to changes in editor behaviors and new subjective writing styles that has never seen before by the Wikipedia community. Next slide, please. In our initial investigation, we built a series of bias detection models solely using Wikipedia-based statements alone. And it kind of validated the fact that just by using Wikipedia alone, we won't be able to build a model that can have consistent performance over time. Even though the initial model had a better precision of 77%, its performance kind of degraded over time. To enrich our model performance, we started exploring through cross-domain transfer learning approach by leveraging biased statements from various subjective rich domains, such as political speeches and product reviews. We have observed some encouraging results like 89% accuracy with the Roberta based classifier and also across different topic areas like politics, language and literature based articles. In order to extend our models performance in other topics, we have started working on generating more statements using generative adversarial networks. The generative data can be used to augment our current cross domain bias detection approach to further improve its classification accuracy. Thanks for the opportunity. The next paper is about accessing the quality of health related Wikipedia articles by Luis Coato and Carla Lopez. Hello, thank you, Kartik. Uh, so I am Luis Couto. Me and Carla Teixeira Lopes, we did a research work about assessing the quality of health-related articles in Wikipedia using generic and specific metrics. Next slide, please. Uh, there are many works about assessing the Wikipedia quality using metrics based on generic features, but we, used, we wanted to research if there are specific features on Wikipedia that will be used to assess the quality of health articles and which of them are the most important. We also wanted to propose specific metrics based on these features. And finally, we want to know if these metrics are better to those existing generic features for the health domain. To achieve these objectives, we used the methodology represented in this diagram. So we began by exploring the health-related content features in articles from health and medicine areas. 
Then we collected the top 1,000 most viewed health articles, a list provided by the Wiki Project Medicine. Uh, after that, we analyzed the quality of generic features proposed by Sevilla and the specific features we proposed on assessing the collected article. From that, we proposed health specific metrics that I will talk about soon. Uh, in the end, we analyzed the quality of the proposed metrics comparing to the generic metrics proposed by Sevilla. Uh, the results are present in the next in the in the this slide. So, as health specific features, we propose those present in the first uh, table of the slide, which are the number of external links with a reputed source, the number of sections in the article that belong to the lists of recommended sections in the Wiki Project Medicine guidelines. Another proposed feature is the presence or not of the article in the healthcare translation task force list. Uh, the next feature is the share of editions made by the Wiki Project Medicine admins. Next, we propose the number of health related templates present in the articles, such as that one in the second figure of the slide. We also propose the number of medical code classifications present in the templates, as represented also in the second figure. Uh, the next feature is the number of health related info boxes, as, re as represented in the first figure. And finally, we propose the number of images included in the info boxes. We adapted the generic metrics of Stevilia, adding or replacing the proposed features, creating the specific metrics shown in the second table of the slide, which are health authority, uh, health completeness, health informativeness, and health consistency. The respective formulas are shown on the slide. And as you can see in the table, we achieved good results with the proposed features and metrics. The most relevant features were the number of reported links, the number of recommended sections, and the articles translated by the task force. We improved all the generic metrics, although we get the best results in the authority and marginal improvements in consistency metrics. With that, I finish my presentation. I'll be available later in chat room three, and next we, we will have the presentation of Bhuvana. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Bhuvana Minakshi, and uh, I'll be uh, uh, presenting the research study on bridging the gender gap in Indian language Wikimedia communities. And uh, this particular uh, research study was done with association uh, with the Center for Internet and Society and uh, the Access uh, to Knowledge uh, program team. Um, this, uh, this study uh, was basically to document and analyze the uh, gender bias in the Indian language uh, Wikimedia communities. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, in this, um, uh, we analyzed uh, the previous research that's that's done globally, and also the research that's focused on uh, Indian language uh, communities itself uh, that have been done in the past. And um, in in a 2018 survey um, from um, uh, from the Wikimedia uh, on a Wikipedia uh, page on uh, gender bias uh, states that um, you know there have been 90 percentage of the contributors across various versions of the Wikipedia and uh, among which um, um, the um, among which the 90 percentage uh, constitutes of um, male participants and 8.8 uh, percentage of uh, female uh, and one percent as uh, non-binary uh, gender um, who have been editing and um, and actively um, participating in uh, Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia uh, project uh, specifically and uh, other studies since 2011 mostly focused on English Wikipedia um, having a percentage of uh, female editors as up to uh, 20 percentage um, and um, um, this gave us a thought about understanding how much of the percentage of the female contributors um, exist in um, exist in the um, in Indian language communities and uh, especially across various Wikimedia projects and also to basically understand uh, how the uh, gender bias has been perceived in the local communities. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, we brought this uh, study into um, uh, three thematic areas, which is mainly about 
um, online participation um, that includes um, content created by women, uh, content about women and their online engagement with communities um, and also uh, understanding offline participation uh, by women across various Indian language communities and um, the strategies to remove barriers to sustain participation of women contributors um, and, um, and mapping the uh, diversity of uh, Wikimedia projects, um, women and how women are involved with um, with uh, sustaining the participations um, across the across the projects. Um, so in this uh, study, we uh, had uh, fifteen interviewees uh, from thirteen different.